seconds before we get started as people are still filing in. Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everyone for joining uh, the final UT Energy Symposium of the fall 2020 semester and of the year 2020. And um, we have a great one today. I can't think about a better way to uh, end our lecture series. Uh, I'm Pierre King, Assistant Director and Research Scientist of the Energy Institute. And today it's my pleasure to introduce Congresswoman Lizzie Fletcher. She represents the seventh district of, of Texas, which is on the west side of Houston. And she's going to give us some insights into the her priorities for the next congressional session. So just a little bit of background on Congresswoman Fletcher. She's a native Houstonian, has just won, I believe, her second term. So congratulations there uh, to the House. Uh, she sits on committees that are highly relevant for energy and the environment. So this is why it's a great pleasure to have her here with us today. Uh, she sits on the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, and she's the chair of the Subcommittee on Energy and also sits on the Subcommittee on Environment. In addition to that, she sits on the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, which has many energy and environmental um, topics that they must have to deal with across water resources, environment, transportation, not just road transport, but pipeline and hazardous materials. Um, and it is a pleasure to have her here. She's focused on legislation uh, looking at uh, the oil and gas industry, as well as carbon dioxide storage and sequestration. So we're looking forward to hear her thoughts. Uh, for those listening, um, we can take questions via the Q&A feature. We do have a hard stop at 6 p.m. So we might not be able to get to any of the questions you submit, but please submit questions and we'll see if we can get to them. And with that, I will now hand it over to Congresswoman Fletcher for uh, her initial thoughts and just telling us how she's approaching the next congressional session. So thank you very much, Congresswoman, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much for that kind introduction, Dr. King, and for inviting me to participate um, in this series. I'm so glad to be here with you and glad to share a few thoughts and take a few questions about our priorities in the next Congress as they relate to energy. Uh, representing the energy capital of the world, I can assure you that there are a few more important things I can do in Congress than help lead the conversation about our energy future. For the next Congress, that means addressing the dual challenge of producing energy for the world and meeting increased demand while reducing harmful emissions and battling climate change. These are real challenges and ones the next Congress will be committed to addressing. To do so, we need the input of a diverse and broad coalition of stakeholders who have the energy expertise we need to chart our path forward. Our plan and our process in the Congress and outside have to be focused on working together, not casting blame or delaying action. And that's a perspective that I have developed um, representing this district and living and working in this district nearly all of my life. I really bring a unique and important perspective to the Congress. I'm so proud to represent the energy capital of the world. Uh, as you mentioned, it is on the west side of Houston. I represent the energy corridor and many of the people who live and work in this district are committed to charting the path forward in energy and making sure that Houston and Texas remain the energy capital of the world. I know that we have the expertise and the drive here to address the dual challenge, meeting this growing demand for energy around the world while reducing carbon emissions and battling climate change. Here in Houston, where I am tonight, we are leading the way. As everyone here watching, I think probably knows, Texas is an all of the above energy state. We lead in domestic oil and gas production, as well as in wind energy. And that emerged from really forward thinking and inclusive policy seen in the state 20 years ago led by Governor Perry. And so I think that this forward thinking and inclusive approach really is instructive to what we need to do at a national level. It's what we need to see and what I'm optimistic we will see in the next Congress. Again, forward looking, inclusive and informed policy that makes a meaningful difference in charting our course forward. Now my perspective has been shaped by the people who live and work in this district 
Of course, having grown up here in the 1970s and 80s and living here nearly all of my life, there's a lot that I've learned about energy almost by osmosis. But there is so much more for all of us to know about our energy ecosystem and the path forward that really requires the expertise of those who live and work here, who understand energy policy, people who have a vision for the future and an understanding of the very real challenges before us. And you know what I can say here in Houston is we know that the last decade has brought an energy renaissance that has reduced costs and increased investment here and around the world. We know that domestic production of oil and natural gas is critical to our national security, to our economy, and to our energy future. And we know that renewable energy is an increasingly important part of our energy mix. We also know that climate change represents a real and growing threat, and we are already experiencing its effects here on the Gulf Coast, emerging from the most active hurricane season I can remember and living with the threat of climate-related uh, climate disasters across the country and around the world. So to meet the challenges in front of us, we really need the US leading the way to an energy future that is safer, cleaner, and more efficient. And one of the things we've seen not in the Congress, but in the Biden administration is certainly an intent to re-engage with the global community on issues of climate to re-enter the Paris Climate Accord. And the Congress, this last Congress, um, did vote on a bill, HR 9, to do exactly that um, and to re-engage with the world and make sure that the United States is leading the world and leading this conversation. Because you know what we have seen in the last decade is these advances in technology that have transformed our energy economy have substantially reduced carbon emissions. Replacing coal-fired power plants with natural gas plants has contributed more to the reduction of domestic carbon emissions than any other effort. And reducing emissions is the key to addressing climate change. So these are the kinds of things that we're focused on, both the big picture questions and the nitty gritty details that, that are all involved when you're making policy. So as chair of the Science, Space and Technology Committee Subcommittee on Energy and a member of its Subcommittee on the Environment, I am really focused on addressing the need for clean, reliable energy at home and around the world and addressing the concerns for our energy needs and our environment. On the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee that you mentioned, also commonly referred to as T&I, uh, we are focused on the questions of how we develop a modern energy infrastructure that both lowers carbon emissions and delivers low-cost energy to consumers and allows the economy to thrive. How do we do that? How do we invest in it? How do we replace our aging infrastructure uh, in the public sector? And how do we do so in a way that's going to help really um, address some of the, the real challenges that we've seen during this COVID-19 pandemic when it comes to, um, to job loss across the country. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about the legislative priorities in these committees that I see for the next Congress, as well as kind of um, this acknowledgement that the Congress as a whole, I think, in every single committee will be tackling these issues, certainly the Energy and Commerce Committee, um, but other committees um, throughout Congress have all been um, given a, a mandate, a, a set of um, priorities in this last Congress from the Select Committee on Climate Change to really think about energy and the environment at, in all the policy uh, going forward. And so I think that you know this really is going to be at the center um, of activity for the 117th Congress. So you know one of the things when it comes to this, I'll start with science, space, and technology. Um, and our legislative priorities. And as I mentioned, chairing uh, the energy subcommittee and being on the environment subcommittee, I always say, I am from the energy capital of the world and I represent the energy capital of the world and we care about the environment too. And I think that that's a critical message to hear from not just Houstonians, but all Texans, um, because that really is reflective of so much of the work that we do here. Um, and a lot of the work that's on our subcommittee is forward looking, ensuring that we're implementing policies that support the critical research and development we need for our energy future. So that's been a huge focus in this last Congress. And as it comes to an end, there are several pieces of legislation that I look forward to advocating for um, and hopefully getting signed into law during the next Congress. Uh, back in September, for example, the House passed H.R. 4447, legislation to make serious federal investments to develop critical energy technologies that we will rely on in our energy mix into the next century. 
uh, as the center of energy expertise and experience in the country. Here in Houston, we're well positioned to utilize the financial support provided through this bill to really chart the course for our energy future. This bill provides a blueprint to ensure that Texans are the ones who are designing and manufacturing the world's energy technology. Uh, it incorporates many of the bills that I worked on throughout this Congress, including, for example, the Fossil Energy Research and Development Act, legislation that I helped lead with my friend from Fort Worth, Congressman Mark Vesey, to expand research and development of large-scale demonstration, carbon capture, utilization, and storage technology. Investing in carbon capture technology is critical to our energy future and to addressing our most pressing environmental challenges. There are companies in my district that are ready to implement carbon capture projects, and I've been glad to work in Congress to make sure that they can, including, importantly, urging the IRS to issue guidance for the 45Q tax credits as quickly as possible so that these projects can get started and introducing bipartisan legislation that helps companies take advantage of the 45Q tax credit, clarifying some of the open questions. Uh, that bill was called the RECOOPS Act, the Redeeming Effectiveness to Carbon Oxide Utilization Plus Sequestration Act, uh, which I introduced in August with Congressman Jeff Bergman. Um, critical work on carbon capture is going on right now, and we have a real opportunity to reduce carbon emissions through these and other carbon capture efforts. Um, and HR 4447 also includes grant funding to continue the important work of modernizing the use of fossil fuels, and it incorporated the ERPA-E reauthorization legislation passed through our subcommittee, uh, which reauthorized the, the funding for the Department of Energy's Advanced Research Projects Agency of Energy to help advance high potential, high impact technologies in early stages of development. Um, the package also included another uh, bill that I worked on, the Better Energy Storage Technology or BEST Act. Uh, this bill reauthorizes the DOE's grid scale storage research to facilitate breakthroughs for the 21st century electrical grid. As we continue to see more renewables added to portfolios across the country, developing modern storage infrastructure to support it will be key to reducing emissions. All of these will be critical components of building our energy future and making sure that energy producers here in Texas have the resources and support they need to continue to lead the world when it comes to energy. Now, on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, a lot of the work that we do complements the work of the Energy Subcommittee. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, Dr. King, um, I serve on several subcommittees there that are focused on the environment, the Water Resources and Environment Subcommittee, um, as well as um, I serve on the Subcommittee on Railroads, Pipelines, and Hazardous Materials. Um, so transportation of energy is critically important in my work in the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. Um, and one of the things that we're really focused on is what the future looks like for transportation and infrastructure, as well as I mentioned earlier, how infrastructure investment at a large scale at the federal level can really help spur our economy. And so a huge part of that is our energy infrastructure. Now, our energy infrastructure um, is largely privately funded, so it's not the same kind of um, investment uh, that you might see in other kinds of projects, but um, there's critical work that needs to be authorized and critical regulations that need to be addressed, uh, that need to be finalized, need to be issued so that construction um, in the energy sector can continue as well. And so one of the huge things we did this year that I was so proud to work on was uh, passing the legislation to authorize the Houston Ship Channel Expansion Project. Expanding the channel is a smart and much needed investment to our infrastructure that will allow the Port of Houston to accommodate increased growth and ensure safe, efficient vessel passage. Um, as many of you, I'm sure, know, the continued growth in oil and gas exports has been one of the bright spots in Texas's energy economy during this current downturn. And the expansion of the Houston Ship Channel will further our region generally and Houston specifically as the national leader in energy exports. And exporting energy is a critical part of our path forward. Um, this is a bill that we are expecting to pass the Senate by the end of the year. 
fingers crossed, um, but hopefully it will pass by the end of the year and be signed into law. So it'll be something that's been accomplished in this Congress um, and we won't have to do it again in the 117th. Um, but looking forward to the 117th Congress, a critical topic will be how we use our infrastructure investment to offset these impacts that we've seen from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so as I mentioned, one of the other things we've got to do is invest in our energy infrastructure. And one way we can do that is by removing barriers to construction and streamlining the permitting process and updating our regulations. Um, now, given uh, the this, this central role that energy plays in my district, people here don't usually ask um, why I am on the Railroads, Pipelines and Hazardous Materials Subcommittee. I don't usually have to explain that, uh, but it is so vital to understand this really unseen infrastructure. Um, you know, people I have heard and have kind of relayed over the, over the years um, that the, the pipeline infrastructure across this country is almost as big as the road infrastructure. We have 2.6 million miles of paved roads and 2.5 million miles of pipelines but the pipelines are buried. You don't see them. You don't know that they're there, uh, but it's critically important that we update that aging infrastructure as well as the crumbling roads and bridges um, that we know and see need improvement. So one of the uh, priorities that I've had throughout the 116th Congress has been to pass the reauthorization of FEMSA, the, the Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, the reauthorization bill so that we can modernize pipeline safety across the board. There's been a lot of back and forth uh, between the House TNI Committee, the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, and the Senate on this topic over the past two years. But I was glad to introduce both an amendment to our bill in the TNI Committee and also standalone legislation over the summer to establish a pilot program for pipeline safety enhancement at FEMSA. And this is just so critically important because, as I mentioned, of these 2.5 million miles of existing pipeline, Texas is home to many of them, and they ensure the safe and efficient delivery of energy across the country. So it's time that the federal regulations keep up with new technologies that make delivery safer and protect our environment. So I'm looking forward to moving this along, um, if not by the end of this Congress, certainly in the next Congress, to advance how we safely transport natural gas and liquids and to spur the construction of pipelines that will also help get our energy workers back to work. So these are just a few of the items on our agenda for the 117th Congress. Um, there's certainly a lot more things that are happening, as I said, in committees throughout the Congress. Um, and there are more concrete steps that we can and will take to build and plan for our energy future. But you know, at the heart of this conversation is really making sure that leaders with expertise in energy from my district, from across Texas, have a voice at the table. Our country leads in energy production and innovation because of the work that we do here in Houston and across Texas. We innovate, we create, we research, we power the world. And it's vital that our partners in Congress recognize this. And so it is my job to bring that perspective, that expertise, those people to Washington to really have a collaborative, informed, meaningful, and effective plan for our future. So that is what I see happening in the 117th Congress and beyond. And I'm so glad to be able to share a little bit of that perspective um, with you this evening. And um, I'm happy to take your questions and, um, and continue our conversation that way. Thank you, Congresswoman. That was a great introduction. So I will uh, take my prerogative as a moderator and um, sort of uh, feed off of some of your comments there. Uh, so you, you mentioned some of the bills you've uh, been working on here in the past, including your RECOOPS Act, which I love the acronym there of the RECOOPS Act, which is about um, carbon capture and utilization and storage and specifically about this yeah, 45Q section of the tax code for tax credits for injecting CO2, either for enhanced oil recovery or for storage. And from my understanding, that is about if uh, allowing the, the money if the tax liability of companies is used up, that they could also still take in that money 
uh, from the 45Q in some way. So I don't know if this is part of what you're waiting from the IRS on that you mentioned. And then the second part of that is why did you see it was important to have, to basically enable companies to be able to use what would normally have been called a tax credit as I guess effectively a, a grant or I don't know how else you would phrase it. Um, why is that important for at least this, this part of low carbon infrastructure? Um, sure. Well, a couple of things. Um, and I guess sort of going into it, how did I realize it was important? Um, like everything I do, it's because it's important to my constituents. And we have a lot of people here who are working day in and day out to bring these projects to life. We actually have um, just outside of my district, um, two different uh, carbon capture projects. Uh, that have been in operation um, and our models for the country. And in fact, we brought our science, space and technology energy subcommittee here to Houston last December, just about a year ago for a field hearing um, on carbon capture. And um, it was incredibly productive to hear the expertise of people here. And we also did a site visit um, with the committee so that folks could see uh, this project in action. And what I've heard from my constituents is there's a ton of interest, there's a ton of work being done. Of course, as you mentioned, we've already got EOR, there's a lot of applications that exist, but to really bring carbon capture to scale needs significant investment. And um, part of the way we can get there is by doing that um, at the DOE labs, which is part of the other bill uh, that I mentioned, the Fossil Energy Research and Development Act, but a big part of doing it is providing incentives. And you know, if we are going to meet our emissions reduction goals, we have to do both. Um, incentives like tax credits have led to the rapid growth of renewable energy technologies like solar, but getting these technologies off the ground is extremely costly. And direct payments can help developers finance these projects while markets are constrained, uh, which is what we saw during the pandemic. That's why I worked with Representative Bergman to introduce the Recoups Act so that developers have a choice to receive this tax credit as a direct payment. Um, there were also similar efforts to do this for wind and solar. And I believe that the federal government has a huge role to play in helping get these technologies off the ground by financing expansive initial research and development. Um, that's why I supported the Fossil Energy Research and Development Act, which you know, can, uh, can be applied to traditional methods um, of carbon capture, but also has great potential for direct air capture. And there's a lot of interest in, um, in really exploring direct air capture possibilities. Um, so I think that you know, that bill, which did pass, as I mentioned earlier, passed as part of that package the House passed in September, um, it would direct the DOE to fund carbon capture research and development and large scale demonstration projects. Those are the kinds of things where we can marshal the resources of the federal government and we can incentivize and get private industry working. And that partnership working together, I think, is the best path forward to help us achieve these goals that are so vital to achieving our climate goals. Right. Um, so you mentioned, um, I guess, an interesting phrase there, the, the resources of the federal government. And, and some of this is becoming more... Uh, in the news and teaching people about, uh, I guess, economic theory, if you will, and uh, what pe people call modern monetary theory, which is that you know the government can spend by uh, by by spending the government effectively prints money and doesn't have the same budget constraints that I do as a household, right? I don't print my own money, so um, and so new you know people promoting the the green new deal think about this and the larger role that the government could play and in investing in infrastructure and in one way or another. Um, so what are your general thoughts on you know, how the government could use, it, federal government could use its capabilities to fund uh, renewables, um, low carbon infrastructure, energy infrastructure in general? Um, should we be thinking about the government just, just buying and, and, and paying for services or paying for infrastructure, maybe owning it more outright versus, as you mentioned earlier, most of much of energy infrastructure is privately owned and then they're looking for a profit. So how do we think about ownership models going forward for a low carbon future? Yeah, well, I think it's a, it's a really interesting question. Um, and certainly there's a lot to unpack there, but I guess I would say a couple of, 
of broad things. Um, number one, I think the federal government already is investing um, in a lot of these technology moves. That's what the DOE labs are doing. That's what we've done when it comes to energy technologies in, in all sorts of ways. And so you know, how I see how we spend our federal dollars um, at every moment is really a reflection of our values and of what we think we can do collectively. Uh, we've certainly seen that this year, in light of the COVID pandemic, we have seen um, opportunities for us to pool our resources and do things better together that we, um, you know, maybe can't do individually. Funding research for the vaccine, which was critically important in the first thing that we passed in Congress back in March, um, expedited funding for uh, the vaccine research and development. And um, you know, whether it's funding the National Institutes of Health more broadly, funding the CDC or funding the specific vaccine research, we've seen that significant government investment can um, have a huge impact. And I think here the question is both how do we want to invest and also what would the outcomes be? Um, so, you know, you also mentioned, and I just sort of want to put out there, uh, you mentioned the Green New Deal. And as a threshold issue, I just also want to say that I think the Green New Deal has become kind of a descriptor for a set of policy ideals and goals. Um, and there are a lot of different things that fall under the umbrella. So, you know, when some folks are talking about projects, they're not necessarily talking about government ownership of resources, but some people certainly are. And I have um, said before that I don't, I don't think that that um, is the right approach. I think it's too much sort of top-down um, government uh, control of a lot of things as some of the proposals are written. Uh, specifically, there's a resolution in the House that I think uh, does that. But but people are using the term more broadly. And you know, frankly, some people are quick to, to use it to just describe wanting to address climate change, while other people are quick to call everything the Green New Deal and use it as a wedge to divide people into camps. And I think that is very dangerous. Um, I think the most important thing we can do in our political lives um, and in our policy space is depoliticize this conversation about energy policy and our energy future because the stakes are really too high for us to do anything else. Um, so what I've always said is I think it's important to think big and to think bold and to think differently and explore ideas about what it is we need to do, what it is we need to invest in, how we can best do that you know, collaboratively so that we get the maximum efficiencies of the government research and also the ingenuity that you see from independent uh, and, and private research and, and enterprise. Um, in fact, I, I, I think that it's why it's so important that we have Texans leading this discussion, right? Because that's what we do here. That's certainly how we see ourselves in Houston. Um, you know, we, we put a man on the moon, right? So I think, uh, in fact, I wrote an article, uh, an op-ed in the Houston Chronicle a year and a half or so ago, kind of laying out the case, saying it's important to think creatively and to put out ideas big and small that can help address these issues that we're experiencing and that we anticipate experiencing. And you know we need a we need a broad array of stakeholders input to do that. Um, so on the on the specifics, I know I've touched on this briefly, but you know I don't think the government should be involved in selecting the technology winners and losers, uh, whether that's natural gas, wind, electric, nuclear. Uh, but with that said, I think the government has a large role to play in incentivizing the development of green technology at the R and D level as well as for deployment. Um, and again, I, I mentioned this earlier, but I think what Governor Perry did here in Texas when it came to developing state funded incentives for transmission lines from West Texas to major metropolitan areas is a great example of a success story here. It led to incredible robust growth of wind energy in a state that's made us the world leader in wind energy today. So I think there is a role to play. Um, I do think decarbonization to some degree is going to include association with profits. And if we want to see large scale deployment, it has to be profitable either on its own or through a government subsidy. So um, these are, are really important questions about how do we do this um, and how do we achieve those goals using the tools that we have at our disposal. Um, and while we can't just print money for everything, we can choose how we allocate the resources we do have. And I think that um, this is an important place where we pool our resources and work together for the common good for everyone across the country and around the globe. Thank you. I think you had a great statement there at the beginning, how the federal government spends is a reflection of our value. So um, how are we spending on energy is reflecting that. Um, since you're on, yeah, with the role of the government and, you know, subsidizing or incentivizing 
technologies. There's a couple of questions here on nuclear. Do you have anything specifically on to say on nuclear about existing nuclear power plants or forward-looking designs and the, I guess the role of the government and some legislation you might be working on? Uh, well, certainly we are talking a lot about nuclear energy on our energy subcommittee. Um, and it's something that I think we need to be talking about the role of nuclear energy. Um, if we are concerned about clean energy, it is clean energy. Uh, but of course, there have always been risks associated with nuclear energy that uh, have cause for concern, whether it is the potential for an incident or whether it is the disposal questions. Uh, there are a lot of concerns, but I think nuclear energy is an important part of our energy mix currently. Um, and it's a place where you start to see some of the geopolitics too. Um, and you know, we haven't really ventured into too much of that here, but certainly um, we have to recognize our role um, and the role of energy in the larger geopolitical space we operate in. And what we know is that there hasn't been recent development and construction. There are, there's some new projects now um, in the South, but for the most part, it's been a long time since we've con con constructed new nuclear facilities um, here in the United States. And what we see is that other countries are developing and building facilities in other parts of the world. Um, and so this is an area where we don't necessarily wanna be left behind. Um, so I think it is really important that we continue to be the leaders. If, if countries around the world are looking to Russia or China to build nuclear reactors for them, we understand the relationship um, that that can create and the risks, the inherent risks for us here for our national security um, and else, elsewhere. So I think it is uh, important for us to talk about how we continue in that space and how we address the very real concerns, um, safety concerns. But you know what we have seen um, is that these, these nuclear facilities have produced very clean energy, very cost effective energy for a long time. And we've got to continue to, to think about how that fits into the energy mix and our overall goals of, of addressing this dual challenge. Right. So I guess my next question here is related to perhaps, yeah, Houston as the, uh, as, you, as you call it, the energy capital of the world, depending on who you are, you might call it the, the hydrocarbon capital uh, of, of the world. Uh, but Texas likes to think of itself generally as a, a center of energy. And as you mentioned, uh, there's a, you know, more wind turbines in Texas than any other state. And, and the, the second presidential debate, now President elect Biden stated he would, you know, said some statement like a transition from the oil industry. And some people took that as a bad or a good thing, uh, statement, depending on what, how you feel about it. But um, how do we, how do you think about that, given your the district you represent specifically, and maybe just more generally at the, at the federal level, um, transit, do, is transitioning from the oil industry, is that uh, transitioning from oil or helping the industry that is in oil and gas uh, transition to a low carbon state of affairs um, that's going to be you know, viewed as, as different things, uh, stopping the use of hydrocarbons versus making them as low carbon as possible. So and your legislation touches on this, but I don't know if you have anything more general to say and um, given the district you represent. <laughs> sure. I mean, I, I think that my message on that really comes from the folks who are operating in this district um, about what it is that they're trying to do. And I think if you look at these leaders in energy, they do see themselves as energy companies, not just hydrocarbon companies. Um, although I think it's important for us all to realize that you know, hydrocarbons are a part of our lives. And I think most people here um, and most policy experts know that hydrocarbons are going to be part of our, our future, uh, our energy future. And the question I think is really, what is the energy mix? Uh, there are certain things that we we need, you know, that we get from hydrocarbons, and there isn't a ready substitute. Uh, the question is, what is the right mix? How do we how do we get to the right mix of sources? At what is the goal, and how do we get there? And I think that um, you know, when it comes to that debate, I, that was clearly um, a, a really short shrift to a very complex question. I think at the end of the day, addressing climate change is all about addressing greenhouse gas emissions. And so our focus needs to be on reducing emissions across the board. I think that that is the focus of the people who are working in energy in this district right now. And they would tell you, many of them are transitioning to a lower carbon 
world and they are addressing their own carbon footprint and, and looking ahead. Um, so they really are integrated and diverse companies, many of them. Um, and you know, people share this, this concern um, about addressing this dual challenge. I keep using that term, but I think that that's you know, really the right thing. And I think the government's focus should be on emissions, not transitioning away from any one technology or one source. Um, in some instances, it might involve rebalancing what our energy mix looks like in the future and where, but it also means focusing on deploying and developing technology to reduce emissions from existing energy sources. And that's what you mentioned, my legislation, that's really important. Providing incentives for companies to reduce or capture their carbon emissions is really important. Um, and I, I look forward to working with stakeholders and members on both sides of the aisle to forward new creative policies to encourage CCUS, direct air capture, um, creative ways to use that captured carbon. Um, and I think we're just starting to see what the, the certain tax credits like 45Q will have, the successes that they'll bring. And I think we'll be able to build on that into the future. So I think right now um, the question is, you know, how do we work together uh, to really be partners in this instead of looking at sort of the world at, at this isolated moment, but, but instead looking at all of us as partners in a project together and seeing how everybody can play a role. And, um, and I know that that's what the folks who live in my district and work in my district want to do and very much see themselves doing uh, now and in the future. Thank you. So in, in terms of, as you say, that putting the, the, the focus on greenhouse gas emissions themselves rather than uh, fossil energy per se, um, here at the academic, academic institution, or at least when I'm normally on campus, um, there, there are many debates about how to incentivize lower carbon things. And of course, at the higher level economists will talk about, yes, I need a carbon price of some sort to send this uh, signal across the economy. Um, you're, you know, given we don't have that, uh, first question is your thoughts on carbon pricing or a, a fee of somehow um, uh, structured by the federal government versus uh, you know the legislation similar to what you're what you what you're already working on and more of the same incentives individual incentives that's what's happening now because we don't have the overall price but that's a much perhaps harder problem to tackle amongst Congress so anyway what are your thoughts on what do you think is more likely going forward and and do you support carbon pricing or a fee of some sort um, well you're right it's certainly an ongoing conversation and I think, um, in my own district, there is not a consensus yet on the best path forward there. And so I haven't signed on to any particular legislation at this point in time um, relating to carbon pricing. I think that we're still working through that. And um, I'm actually working pretty closely with folks at the Greater Houston Partnership who are putting together a plan, have been putting together a plan to really represent a, a thoughtful approach that comes straight from uh, my community. Um, but those, those issues are going around in Congress, and certainly I think an easy first step is the legislation that I have already worked on and promoted that are providing these incentives and also increasing um, the investment at the DOE labs uh, to do some of these projects. Um, I do think that you will continue to hear that conversation um, in Congress, and there are different approaches, and there are actually competing pieces of legislation that have similar, similar objectives but different means of getting there. And so I think that that will be a conversation we continue to have in the 117th Congress. And as the consensus develops um, from this community, I will certainly be bringing that perspective to Washington. Great, thanks. So that's good, good, uh, good feedback on how you, your constituency is such based in the energy system and how you see that with regard to the, to the bigger picture. Um, let me step a little bit outside directly energy and and CO2 perhaps, and think more environmental types of legislation. Um, are you working on anything or do you have any thoughts about incentivizing recycling or circular economy type of ideas? Um, any, any thoughts on that? Get, particularly given the oil and gas links to petrochemical industry and plastics and, and, and the kinds of impacts from that. We have plastics everywhere in our, basically in our, in our lives and they're quite prevalent, uh, which makes them prevalent in the environment as well. So any thoughts on recycling in general and uh, circular economy? Uh, 
Well, I, I would say two things. One, I'm a huge fan of recycling in general. Uh, I was telling someone just the other day that when I was in high school, before there was curbside recycling um, all around Houston, my sister actually drove the recycling car and people used to fill our car every, um, every day with recycling and we would drive it to the recycling center on the weekends. Um, so it is so deeply ingrained um, in me that we should absolutely try to reuse and recycle what we can that we consume. And I think, you know, at a policy level, uh, there's absolutely a need for better recycling policies in the US, whether that's for household waste or renewable energy waste. Um, but, you know, these new policies have to be paired with an investment in research to help advance these recycling technologies. Um, some of it is already being done at the US National Renewable Energy Laboratory, uh, but more can be done with additional funding. And I think that that's something that we should definitely be looking at. Certainly the markets have changed um, over the years. We know that folks who, who were taking our recycling in the past um, are no longer interested. The market has changed. And so that you know, has a real impact on what we're able to do. Uh, but as a general value proposition of, of recycling and reusing, um, I think we absolutely should do that and we should encourage it. Uh, at a policy level. Okay, um, Congresswoman, I think first I'm gonna thank you for being so supportive of the DOE labs. I know that persons like myself at academic institutions, we the work we can do is enhanced by the work at the DOE labs and the data that's collected by the Energy Information Administration. So thanks for continued support for that. And I think I would like to respect your time uh, that you have to go to other engagements and, and do and, and vote on things, which is what <laughs> we need you to be doing. So uh, I'll give you the last word, but thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, this was a great way to end our fall symposium series. So if you have any last words, go ahead. Oh, well, thank you so much. I'm so grateful to be um, invited to participate um, and glad to hear from you. Um, I hope that in the future, I'll get to hear your policy ideas and the things that you think that we should be working on. Um, but I'm always get, glad to give a preview um, and let you know a little bit about what we're doing. And what I would love to just impart um, as sort of a final um, note is just how important it is to continue to engage with people like me who have these jobs um, and people throughout our community in this conversation about energy and the environment. I think for, for so many of us, we've taken kind of our energy uh, ecosystem for granted. Um, and we have real complex issues in front of us that we've got to deal with. And the best thing we can have is a, an informed public that's coming together, um, finding common ground and working together to solve our problems. Um, and the one note I want to leave with is I really do think we can depoliticize this conversation. I think we have to. Um, and I think that there's a real opportunity to have bipartisan support and bipartisan policy proposals that will achieve these goals. Um, and we absolutely need to do that. We need to figure out how to come together and how to find common ground. And a lot of people don't realize, so I always like to tell people, that we passed a lot of bipartisan legislation in the 116th Congress. We can and do work together. And I think there is no more important place for us to do that than on this topic here um, to address energy and environment, to address COVID-19. Um, I am optimistic that we will see some movement on that um, in the very near future. But um, I think you know the stakes are too high um, for us to get into camps. We really need everybody's expertise. We need the folks who are on this call um, or on the Zoom meeting who are engaged in these matters to really engage with policymakers and with neighbors and with everybody in between so that we can really work together on charting our course for the future. And I have a lot of confidence and optimism that we will. So I appreciate being invited to share my thoughts. I look forward to hearing your thoughts and look forward to the next time we get the chance to visit. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. At, here at UT, we do have things we can share with you to hopefully help this uh, uh, congenial conversation. So we'll work with you.